iron, Roy. Thank you. I wanted to start out talking with you a little bit about your family and your upbringing. What was it like? My upbringing was very unusual, I think. I certainly felt, never felt that I fit into the other families on the block. Um, my parents are both professional musicians, so uh, our days were really defined by what gigs they had. And of course, every evening they went to work. Mm -hmm. When everyone else's family came home, my parents went to work. So uh, it was pretty, it was pretty unusual. I grew up in Manhattan for the first five years of my life, uh, and then we moved out to Westchester. So my parents commuted to New York to work. So it was, it was a lot of time spent apart. Mm -hmm. What impact did you having two professional musicians as your parents have on you? Were you happy with that being different or? I think as a child, you're not really, it's, you don't judge it so much. It just is uh, the way it is. And uh, in retrospect, looking back, I think having parents who were professional musicians uh, was an incredible advantage in many ways because uh, I think as artists, they live their lives in a very free form. Uh, they, they saw possibility always. Um, and they're self-starting people. I mean, maybe they're unusual even for musicians, but they're people who get an idea and then actualize it. Uh, so not only are they musicians, my father likes to build houses, uh, but that's something he didn't really know how to do. So he would build houses around us and, and we'd have to adapt. And my mother is, Besides a cellist, she's an incredible potter, so she makes all of our plates, and she's a weaver, and she's a, you know, so I think it was just an intensely artistic environment to grow up in, but I think the, the greatest thing it gave me was a sense of uh, possibility that if you get an idea, all you have to do is start, and you'll figure out how to achieve it, so that nothing is, is out of one's realm. Was there a moment that you remember when you knew that music for you too would be a driving force in your life? Well, as a child of professional musicians, there was never a moment that I didn't think music would be part of my life. Uh, my parents started me on piano when I was two and a violin when I was five or six. So music was always, um, it was always implied. It was always part of everything we did. It was just you know, it was who you were. And I think for me, a, a defining moment really came when I was nine years old and I saw Leonard Bernstein conduct because that's the day that I decided I must be a conductor. So I remember that quite vividly and that feeling never left me. I, I had that every day of my life. My father took me to a young people's concert um, and we sat very close to uh, Leonard Bernstein and he, I didn't really know who he was. I, I didn't have a preconception at all, but this guy sort of ran out on stage and jumped on the podium, and he was very, he cut an incredible figure. You know, he was wearing a turtleneck. I think I, that seemed to break all the rules. And uh, he was young, he was handsome. He And the thing that impressed me the most, I think, was that he kept turning around and talking to us. And I was convinced that he was talking just to me. And uh, uh, his, charisma, his enthusiasm for the music, you know, his clearly his passion about what he was doing spoke to me. And I remember, I, you know, I can't remember the pieces to this day, but I can remember turning to my father and say, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to be a conductor. So. How did your parents and your father react? As long as I went into music, they didn't mind uh, what, in, what my instrument would be, even the orchestra. But uh, it was interesting because this was the first, the first moment where I felt I was defining myself. You know, prior to that, I was doing what my parents wanted me to do, I think. And this conducting appealed to me on, I think, intrinsically on many different levels. I, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I think this sense of leadership and galvanizing people, I think that came through and spoke to me through Bernstein. Um, but when I told my violin teacher at Juilliard, I was in the Juilliard pre-college, she told me that, well, conductors, you know, you're too young to be a conductor. And then this was the news that was the most shocking, she said, and, and girls don't do that. And so 
I was devastated. I, I never, this, I never even considered this possibility. And so I went home and I said, you know, Miss Pardee said that girls can't be conductors. What, what's up with that? And my mother was so angry. She said, that's ridiculous. I'm going to call her up right away and tell her, you know, you should never tell. So clearly my parents were supportive of the idea. And, and I think the outrage that my mother expressed was extremely helpful and validating for me. And she didn't say, yeah, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't. She said, no, absolutely not. You, you can do anything you want to do and you can be anything you want to be. And my father, um, who's much quieter, because my mother's very gregarious, um, he, he went and uh, when I came down for breakfast that week, I, I don't know if this is the next morning or a few mornings, there was a long wooden box and I opened it up and it was filled with batons. And it was very, very touching. I still have the box. And uh, I think that kind of both extroverted and, and quiet uh, support of me was really what enabled me to persevere always. What was the message it said to you? Oh, I mean, you can do anything you want to do. And that's the kind of life they led. They're people who, I mean, not just in music, they just, look, if you want to do something, just figure it out. It's not a big deal. What about your other teachers? How encouraging were they? Or were there many more moments of like sexism where you were pushed to stay with the instrument as opposed to conducting? No, I don't. I think that was the that's really the major moment I remember, but maybe because it was the first moment, it's, it stuck out in my mind. And also I, I was so, I was in such awe of my teacher, you know, and, and really revered her opinion. So I think that was shocking, but. What did you think when she said that? Well, it, it started a long, a long-term thought process for me because I, had, I really had never considered that girls couldn't do something. I mean, I, I, the concept was completely foreign to me. But of course, as I looked around, I noticed, oh, uh, maybe she's right. And I think it, you know, that comment combined with society, especially in those days, the, the lack of women in leadership roles in society, I think it probably inhibited me a little bit from pursuing this or overtly pursuing this, um, as I wished I could, but also, the barrier to being becoming a conductor is youth, or was in that day. Today it's not. Um, you know, you see on the internet three-year-old conductors and everything. But um, in those days, it was thought that you, you really couldn't even get into conducting until your 20s or 30s. So that was an additional um, obstacle to overcome because I was, you know, still just not even a teenager yet. So, but what I would try to do is take every opportunity and try to study and learn and figure out what the conductors were doing. So when I played in the orchestra at Juilliard, I would bring the study scores, my father would buy them for me. So I would have the whole score and I'd be, you know, playing along my violin, but I'd also be studying the score as it went and trying to figure out. So it became a, a passion, sort of a hidden passion of mine to try to figure out how I could become a conductor and how would I, how would I conduct this piece and what can I learn from this person. I've read that you had used to hold parties so that you had some <laughs> people to practice on. Can you right, tell me a little a, bit about that? When I came back to Juilliard after I went to Yale, I would invite friends over to my studio apartment and I'd say, oh, you know, I'm going to have pizza and beer and that was a big draw. And uh, I said, oh, and do you mind bringing your instrument and maybe play through a Mozart symphony or so I would have friends come over and, you know, they would tolerate it once or twice and then I'd have to move to a new group of friends to have them come over. And we had some fun. I would conduct them, they'd play for me and they'd, uh, we'd talk about uh, conducting in music and of course when you're young and really uh, passionate about something and we'd play chamber music and other things. But I do remember one evening where um, I had uh, 
a very good friend of mine played the saxophone. He was sort of from another another branch of music entirely. And another friend of mine is an incredible classical guitarist. So I had a saxophone, a guitar, and then traditional orchestral instruments, um, an oboist and a violinist. And it was the funniest Mozart symphony you've ever heard with these people sort of, you know, guitaring along. <laughs> but it was great. And it was about making music. And, and these friends eventually uh, became in many ways, I think, my teachers, uh, because I decided finally that the best way to become a conductor would be to start my own orchestra. And so, of course, I called all my friends, and uh, they all became part of this uh, sort of larger effort. So you never really stopped from that moment wanting to be a conductor. You continued to study an instrument? I went to high school, and then I went to um, Yale as an undergraduate, and then I went back to Juilliard to get my master's. And it, my master's was in violin performance, so I was a violinist. I would seize every opportunity I could to try to attend the conducting classes or play for the conducting orchestras at Yale and at Juilliard. Um, I didn't feel equipped to really even audition yet for a program. Uh, eventually I did audition for the Juilliard program a, a few times and I never got in. Um, but I got pretty close and I thought that was a quite an accomplishment considering I'd never actually conducted. What did you think when you didn't get in? Well, that led me to the conclusion that I was um, perhaps barking up the wrong tree, that maybe going to school for conducting wasn't the best methodology for me. And instead, you know, it, it's the realization. Conducting is very different from playing an instrument. As a violinist, I could practice 10 hours a day if I wanted to. But as a conductor, you can't practice. You don't have an instrument. So there's such a steep learning curve, you know, because you go from being, I was a very good violinist, at, you know, really top of your field to being an amateur but in charge of everyone. You know, it's, and how do you gain that experience? And how do you, how does one figure out what works, what doesn't work? Um, and so I decided that the best way to do that would be to start my own orchestra uh, and comprised of people that are supportive of me and would help with constructive criticism. So I think I needed those, uh, those eight, 10 years of really working with my own projects and getting feedback from my colleagues and friends in order to develop mm -hmm. my skills. Did you ever doubt your ability to be a conductor, especially since you were a woman? I don't think any woman you speak to will say that being a woman brought any insecurity into the picture. Um, society certainly tells us that being a woman is some sort of handicap uh, in terms of attaining the highest levels of leadership. But I don't think we as women ever experience that. I mean, we are who we are. I don't run around thinking, oh my God, I'm a woman. You know, I mean, I am who I am. And uh, the gender is really just a, a, a fact of nature. It, it doesn't, I don't think it comes into play at all. But I certainly had moments when I thought, I wonder if society is ready um, to embrace a woman in this kind of leadership role, especially in classical music, which is terribly conservative. Uh, but I never, I never doubted that I would achieve my goal of becoming a conductor. And I never, I mean, I think always, everyone always wants to rise in, in one's field, but I never did it for that reason. And I think that's probably why I succeeded. You did it for? Because I love it. That's it. I did it because I couldn't not do it. What was the moment when you realized that you were going to make it as a conductor? I'm not sure this was a moment when I felt I would make it. You know, I, it's a profession that um, is very unpredictable, you know, and one, there's, no, there's no set path to, you know, if you do this, then you're guaranteed to do that and then that. It doesn't work like that. It's really a, mm -hmm. a roller coaster kind of career path. Um, I think in terms of feeling validated that I had something to bring to the table, let's put it that way, something important to say, was probably when I finally became a student of Leonard Bernstein. Uh, when I was in my early 30s, I was at Tanglewood, and 
I was selected to um, conduct a concert with Bernstein. So that was a very, very special moment for me. And uh, I think his support and, again, the sense of validation. He was uh, very warm, very giving, but also I think he got me. When he said, uh, oh, that's, that was a great idea. I'm, I'm going to steal that idea, I said. Leonard Bernstein's going to steal something from me. I, I, I said, oh, please, steal anything you want. I said, because, of course, I, I stole the whole idea about being a conductor from you. And uh, uh, I think having Bernstein just reinforce my conviction uh, was extremely encouraging. Both times you've mentioned him, your whole face lights up. <laughs> what, what is it about him? That well, I, I think he was a unique a unique individual. I'm, I'm not sure we'll ever see anyone quite like him. He broke every single rule. He broke every single barrier. He was a bigger than life kind of person. And I guess for me, it's, it's a very simple um, uh, love that I had for him because he, he was a, my hero. You know, from nine years old, he was my hero and sort of this unreachable hero. And I was afraid ever to meet him because I thought I would lose my power to speak. And uh, then when I met him and I studied with him, he was even greater than I had hoped. You know, so I think it's rare to have a hero. And I think it's very rare to have that hero exceed one's expectations. So. Uh, I am grateful that I got to know him. I'm, I'm only sorry he, he didn't live longer. He has these fantastic children who come to my concerts and we collaborate on things and I wish he could be around to see that as well. Is there any other very pivotal moments that you'd like to tell me about or describe in your early career conducting? A conducting career is very um, ephemeral and unpredictable. And what, one has no idea, you have no idea where you're going to suddenly take a detour and end up with an orchestra here or doing this here or doing that there. Um, when I first started working in Europe, uh, my manager said, well, don't have any high expectations, you know, a woman on the podium in Europe, and, okay. And uh, then I started working in the UK a little bit and <clears throat> it just was this kind of trajectory. and. Uh, I fell in love with the British musicians. We really connected. It was all about the music. And pretty soon I was appointed a music director of the Bournemouth Symphony. So I became the first woman to head a major British orchestra. And I guess for me, the, the interesting part about that was I, at the time of my appointment, there was one line in the paper that said the woman thing. And that was it. They never mentioned it again. And so, you know, you start to understand that different cultures deal with this gender issue much, much differently mm -hmm. from others. When I made my debut at La Scala, also the first woman to conduct there in 230 years, or however many, 5,000 years. And um, they had a big press conference. It was like the moon landing. And the first question from the journalist, do you cook? So, I mean, you just realize, wow, Okay, some people are living in the dark ages and some people are way ahead of us. Can you tell me now about the moment you learned that you were selected to be the head of the orchestra? I received a call from the head of the board and the um, managing director at the time of the Baltimore Symphony and they said, would you come to New York and talk to us about uh, becoming our next music director? And uh, so I was I was thrilled because uh, I had guest conducted the Baltimore Symphony several times, and I thought, I thought they were a great orchestra. I thought they could be even greater um, with attention and you know mm -hmm. discipline and someone who really cared at the helm. And uh, so I was very, very excited about the prospect. Well, when you first heard that, or you put the phone down, like what were your th what were your first thoughts? I was excited, but I was cautiously excited because. Um, I knew that the Baltimore Symphony had some big challenges in front of it. Uh, I knew it was an orchestra that had a huge debt. I knew their subscriber base had fallen off. I knew they hadn't made a record in uh, any recordings in about a decade. So I knew that it was a situation that was fraught with challenges. 
Um, I, I had no idea how many challenges at that time, but uh, so I was cautiously excited about it, let's put it that way. The time when I started it was, it was quite exciting uh, finally to get over all the hurdle of finally getting to uh, my start um, with the orchestra. And I mean it was exciting because there was a lot of attention brought to the orchestra and to me and to be, you know, the person of the week and all these things. I mean, uh, that was fun, but again, I guess, for me, the issue of gender doesn't, it doesn't really resonate with me at all. I, it seems, it seems like a, um, a rather trite point to receive attention for. It's, it's sort of a, it's a fluke of birth, not really anything I had any, any say in or any, I didn't have to work hard for that position. So I always feel that, um, I, I always feel slightly uh, conflicted, I guess, when, when that's what's cited. Did you have no feeling about breaking that barrier here? I think I have the same feeling when I'm the first woman to do anything, which is that I'm, I feel very proud. But I also find it somewhat pathetic that we can be in the 21st century and there can still be firsts for women. So I guess I feel both things at the same time. Probably pride wins out. Certainly for my parents, pride wins out. But what happens, I think, is that when one is the first um, and when one gets so much attention, it creates an opportunity to um, try to reach out and become, I think naturally you, you are a role, role model. And that's something that I happily embrace because I think that it gives me an opportunity to create um, an, a culture where women feel they are entitled to step up to the top levels. Mm -hmm. And not just in music, but in other fields. So I do a lot of speaking, I do a lot of workshops. I've established a fellowship for talented young women conductors to mm -hmm. try to create opportunities for them. So what happens is, uh, it allows me these opportunities. So I think one has to maximize every, every opportunity. Let me go back to your appointment. You know, there was some controversy about it. Some of the musicians actually were publicly questioning your credentials. And I'm wondering why. I think you were cited as calling it a hit and run accident. <laughs> so can you tell me why and tell me a little bit about it? I think I stepped into a very complex um, situation with the Baltimore Symphony when I was first appointed. Um, in looking back, uh, I think that the musicians had, they'd endured many, many years of feeling uh, unheard and um, that their opinions weren't considered. You know what happens in in the not-for-profit world often, especially in the orchestra world, is, you know, the management teams come and go, the music directors come and go, and many musicians spend their entire careers with one orchestra. So they see all of these changes, and yet, you know, nobody ever listens to them. Well, we tried that. Well, we knew you weren't going to, well. And so I think they, they had, they were really suffering from a sense of neglect. Um, I think my appointment was a cathartic moment for them to speak out. I don't know that it was so much about me personally as about not being heard. And I think it was very, very hard not to take it personally. Um, but I really tried to put myself in their position to understand what was motivating this because I certainly knew that I could bring a lot to the table, but I don't think they knew me that well. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I don't think anyone had really stopped to try to figure out what was unhealthy for them in the environment that they were working. Was it upsetting? Were oh. you angry, surprised, or? I was, I was all of those things, of course. I, it was a very, uh, I think I was shocked. That, that was my initial reaction. It did feel a little bit like a hit and run accident. I didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was protracted. It lasted a long time. It, uh, it felt threatening to everything I had uh, 
I, I had accomplished. Um, it was frightening. It was depressing. Uh, it, it was all of those things. You know, especially to feel so um, enthusiastic and upbeat about something only to have it over almost overnight turn into what what felt like you know the end of my career in a way mm -hmm. and uh, that was very it was a very very difficult time I would say for me but it only it only reinforced my uh, determination really to try to fix and find out what was going on with these musicians and this situation in Baltimore. But I wasn't going to do it if I didn't have their support. So I came and spoke to them privately. And uh, I, I laid out at least my um, short-term vision for the orchestra. And they said, you have our support. And so we started a relationship. And I think none of us really likes to look back on that time. And I would include all the musicians in that, because I don't think it was their best moment. Um, but I think if you look at them today, you'll see them at their best, and that's what makes me proud. What do you think you're breaking that barrier, so to speak, meant to other women? I have the experience of women coming to concerts and talking to me afterward and saying, uh, you know, this was different for me. I felt I could be doing this. And, and so I think the experience is more empowering and more personal for many women, um, seeing a woman in charge and on the podium. So that's, that's always exciting to me, or young women, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about being a conductor, it's great. Even women who were not wanting to be musicians, it seemed to galvanize them. Was that your experience, like your appointment? I think it's a, a, a sense of um, accomplishment whenever, I mean, when I saw Sally Ride, you know, take the space shuttle, I was excited. You know, there's a sense of, um, Great, you know, go girl, that kind of experience. Uh, uh, I think now, uh, in looking at the climate, now I am trying to really celebrate women in roles of leadership. And this coming season in Baltimore, we're, our, our season theme is revolutionary women. So we're trying to reach out to women across all disciplines and uh, through every economic strata to participate and engage in discussions about women's issues and, and women in leadership roles. You've watched many men lead, you know, and literally in this case mm -hmm. at the podium. How is it different for a woman to lead an orchestra? Well, I don't think the essence of leadership differs whether you're a conductor or a CEO. I think leadership has certain qualities that are um, just undeniable. Uh, regardless of what what field one is in. But I do think because of uh, the nature of conducting, which is gestural, so that I'm depicting the music with my gestures and eliciting a certain kind of response from the musicians, I do think that it's important to, as women, to understand how society and how my musicians read my gestures and they read my gestures differently from the same gestures from a man. That is just pure and simply factual. So that if I'm doing something that's very sensitive, delicate, it can come across as seeming a little girly, you know, or lightweight. But if a man is doing really the exact same gestures, he's sensitive. I mean, it, it's not, I'm not trying to be facetious at all. I'm just trying to l analyze what I'm doing so that I can get the best musical result. And when I teach students, not just women, men too, I talk to them about gesture and what it means because I think as women, we have to think it through twice. We have to think about how to convey the music, but also how our gesture is perceived. So I think that does add a, another layer of complexity to what we do as women. I've read that you've said that you've had to make accommodations because of this issue of gender and gesture. Can you explain it a little more or demonstrate a little? When one is very, very strong, you know, and you're trying to get a huge sound from the brass and the, you know, and if 
as a woman, if you're really too aggressive, there's something I can't, uh, I don't know if I can really articulate it in words, but there's something that really can be off-putting about it. Whereas when a man is very, very strong, that's acceptable. It's expected. I think maybe because it's unexpected from a woman, that kind of, you know, come on, give it to me, I, you know, and I think it's important to try to dissociate the gesture from any um, sort of stereotypic reactions so that I try, I've tried to sort of de-genderize my gesture. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I try to, I work hard at getting a sound from the orchestra that's all about sound and not about, oh, you want a loud sound, you know, so that it, it doesn't evoke any kind of specific response. And I think one of the greatest compliments, um, someone uh, early, it was early in my career, one of the big brass guys came up to me and said, you know, you're great. I, I never noticed you were a woman. You know, so, I, and I said, well, thank you very much. You know, I didn't, I, I understood it was a compliment. I mean, when you think about it, it's a terrible compliment, but um, I, I think that's the idea mm -hmm. that I, you know, the, the issue that you're a woman or a man or anything, it becomes immediately irrelevant. So I think gesture has to be all about the music and conveying that essence of the music and uh, not specific to me as a human being, me as a woman, me as anything. If you're making these gestures and they do have that reaction you described, what happens? Is it the orchestra or the audience or both? I don't, you know, I can only see it in other people. It's very hard to see it in oneself. But I can see when students are um, too pushy and the sound of the orchestra closes down or, you know, their attitude gets a little bit, ugh, you know, oh, she's such a you-know-what and, oh, why is she harping on us? Oh, she's nag. You know, all these yeah. sort of, oh, or if you get too excited, oh, she's hysterical. I mean, it's very typical. It's the same things that are said in every field about women who are expressing themselves in a very overt way you know, this is somehow not acceptable. And I think as a leader, you have to be willing to, probably the biggest quality I think that one needs to have is a sense of um, self and a sense of humor about oneself, you know, because we all come across um, less than appealing at certain moments. And I, I think we're the ones that have to own, own that. One thing, let me go back to your first performance here. Can you describe that first performance and the standing ovation you got? The first time that I conducted in Baltimore after my appointment and all this controversy, I just walked out and the audience stood up. I didn't even do anything yet. It was very, very welcoming and very heartening. And uh, I, felt, I felt good. I felt connected right away to this community. It was great. Did you ever consider walking away during the controversy? Oh, absolutely. I, I considered walking away several times. This was funny because I called my parents and I said, oh, I'm so excited, you know, I, I think I'm, I'll take over the Baltimore Symphony. Oh, it's great news. A couple days later, I don't know, hope you won't be disappointed. I've decided not to take the job. Then I called back, listen, I might take the job after all, you know. So my parents came to the place where they said, uh, listen, whatever you do, it's we're okay with it. Um, you know, you need to be happy and, and be in a place where you can make great music. So I definitely considered not taking the job. I also considered, um, I, I took the advice of many people in the industry, some leading people in the industry, who, uh, who advised me to run, not walk as fast as I could away from this um, organization because of the way it was handled, but also because of the problems uh, that I was walking into. But I weighed it carefully myself. Um, and I think, again, part of being a secure and, and good leader is being able to take, take, a, take in everyone's advice and then make one's own decision, you know, based on everything mm -hmm. and, and follow your instinct. And my instinct, I think, was always right. I always thought this was a great orchestra. I always thought the musicians were wonderful people, even during this difficult time. Uh, and I don't think I could love an orchestra more.
And I certainly never thought I'd be saying that. And may you? <laughs> well, listen, you have to ask them. I don't know. <laughs> did you consider what message it would send if you walked away? I did think to myself, well, <laughs> you know, to be the first woman to head a full-time American orchestra and then to chicken out and walk away, not a good choice. You know, so that did play a role in my decision. Why do you think that there were so few women conducting or you were the first as a major orchestra? I think it's both a complex and a simple answer um, to a complex and simple question. Uh, I think that it's not about, I think it's about comfort level. This is what I've decided. I think it's about society being comfortable with something. And I've come to that by gauging my own personal responses to things. Like I got on a United flight and I looked to see who was flying the plane. And there were three women in the cockpit. And I said, oh my God, I gotta get, gotta get off. I said, oh my God, I've gotta get off this flight. You know, I mean, instinctually, I just thought, this is, there's something wrong. I mean, it was a fantastic flight. It was smooth, beautiful, calm. Um, but I started thinking about my reaction to that, that it was just out of my frame of reference. It was out of my comfort zone. When I watched television, when I watched the television news, I remember when there were two men anchoring the news. But I'm not comfortable anymore with two men anchoring. I like one woman and one man, because that's where we are now. That's my comfort level. I just started assessing how I view the world. And it's a slow progression to becoming comfortable with a different setup, with a woman or more women doing certain things. So I think it's a matter of conditioning. And this is something that I really adhere to in terms of my um, fellowship for women conductors. What I'm trying to do is create as many opportunities for many women to be seen on podiums. You see, I think we have to, and what concerns me is that I, I, I want to absolutely avoid being the only one because then it becomes about me specifically rather than about women in general. So we have to have, you know, and I don't want orchestras to think, well, we have, we have the woman conductor, now we don't have to do that anymore. You know, tick that box. So I'm very keen to create as many opportunities around, the, particularly around America, for women to be seen on the podiums of, of our orchestras. Uh, because I think as we gain comfort with that, then the opportunities will come. Mm -hmm. I also think when we have a woman president, things will change dramatically because I think that will, I think that's what happened in Britain and that's why there isn't the same kind of um, surprise and discomfort with a woman in the ultimate authority position. Since you took over your post, what discrimination, if any, do you think you face because of gender? Well, you know, discrimination, this is also a very difficult question, I think, to um, to assess objectively what is what is discrimination. I, I haven't felt any kind of overt discrimination. I have to say that um, the board and the uh, orchestra and the community couldn't be more embracing. So I don't feel that at all. I think the there are moments that I wonder, but I think every woman wonders this. So, you know, I wonder, would they speak to me like that if I were a man? And ultimately, I usually say, yeah, probably. So um, I, I have rarely experienced what I would term discrimination. But also, I, you know, I'm unwilling to really contemplate being discriminated against. So maybe that helps me, too. What do you mean, contemplate? That's not the place I go ever when something doesn't work out. I mean, I know women who say, oh, I didn't get that job because I'm a woman. I didn't get it. Uh, this didn't happen because I'm a woman. I think that's all that, all that results from that is you develop a terrible chip on your shoulder and it's an easy out. 
Instead, when I didn't get an appointment or didn't win an audition, I went back and said, okay, how can I be better? So that ultimately, nobody can say you can't have the job because you're just too good. You have to have that job. Let me ask you, since taking over, what accomplishments are you proudest of here? I have a couple of different levels of um, accomplishments that I'm proud of. I, I would say that there are two initiatives that I was able to get off the ground here in Baltimore that give me great joy. And, but this is joy that's not really connected to music making. Um, it's sort of a joy in looking forward 20 years to coming back to visit after I haven't been here and seeing what happens with these programs and initiatives. One is an after school program we've started for um, kids in West Baltimore. And these are minority kids that wouldn't have access to playing musical instruments at all if it weren't for this program. We started uh, three years ago with 30 kids and we have 300 now. And it's called ORCHIDS, O-R-C-H, kids. And it's, a, I think, an inspired and inspiring program. Uh, and this started really from my desire to see the demographics of our orchestras change. They don't reflect the diversity of our communities right now. And that's because uh, not everyone has access to learning instruments when they're young. So I'm hoping in 10, 20 years, we'll see a lot of these orchids in our major orchestras. Um, and more importantly, you see these kids, like, like me growing up, having a sense of possibility. You know, you start to picture yourself, I never thought I'd play the violin. Oh, okay, maybe I'll do that. Oh, maybe I'll fly a plane. You know, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll teach, maybe I'll... And so um, I feel great about that program. And also we started a, recently a program for adults who played instruments as kids or who perhaps are playing in amateur non-professional orchestras now and it's a program called Rusty Musicians and they come and play with the Baltimore Symphony and we then further developed that into a fantasy camp called the BSO Academy for Adults and uh, we're starting our second year of that and we've doubled our attendance. We have 100 people coming to play and work with the Baltimore mm -hmm. Symphony for a week and I guess part of this um, both initiatives, uh, part of my motivation was to try to enable my musicians to see how valued they are. So when I see my oboist sitting next to a doctor, a lawyer, who plays the oboe, who's looking at my oboist, you know, with this sense of awe and admiration, um, and my oboist realizes, oh, this person wants to be me. You know what I mean? There's, there's nothing more validating than having a peer say, God, I wish I could do what you do, and then starting to feel good about what you do. Or in, the ter in, in terms of orchids, um, I'm hoping that that program will eventually be a place where my musicians can, perhaps after they've retired, they can use their expertise and all this mm -hmm. knowledge to share with the young people so that it becomes a, almost a cycle of mentoring. Uh, that's what I'd like to see. So those two programs, which aren't really directly related to what we do on stage, um, give me great hope for the future. Um, but in terms of our musical accomplishments, uh, I think um, the fact that we're one of the leading uh, orchestras in terms of recordings makes me very proud, especially coming from the place they were. And uh, our appearances every year at Carnegie Hall now, and uh, our audiences that are so enthusiastic. So I think on every level, things are going well. It said that the audiences love you. Why well, do you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm not a good judge of that, but it's they good. like to holler and stuff, and that's good. That's always a good sign. Why do you think they take, why do you think you're so popular with them? Oh, I don't, you know, I don't presume to, you know, you're popular one day, you're unpopular the next day, but um, I think, I think I, I, I just am who I am. It's not, um, I don't look at art as an elitist experience. I, 
I look at art as a birthright. And um, it's my responsibility to enable people to access the art form. So I talk to the audience. I, um, I try to build programs that are compelling in an emotional journey way. Uh, I try to be accessible. I do talks after the concert. And I think when, when one has uh, a sort of a behind the scenes access to something, you enjoy it so much more. I know when I go to a museum with someone who really knows the art and can point out, oh, look at the light, look at the perspective, look at what he's doing here, what, what she's painted, what she's sculpted. I enjoy it so much more. So that's what I'm trying to do. Do you consider yourself a feminist? I don't know when feminism became a dirty word, uh, but uh, I guess I would say that I, uh, I am definitely a feminist and uh, proud of it and always have been and follow in the footsteps of my mom and uh, so many great women who have stood up for equality. Everyone should be treated equally. I believe in equal pay for equal work. I believe in equal opportunity for every single person uh, alive. And, you know, I'm, I guess I, I still reel from the fact that in America we couldn't pass the Equal Rights Amendment. I think that's shocking. Really, I do. And I think for a country that espouses freedom mm -hmm. and uh, individuality, we should be ashamed of ourselves. What milestones in the women's movement do you remember? Are, are any that stand out to you? I would count Gloria Steinem among uh, my heroines, but I should say heroes probably. Um, and uh, she's been to hear the Baltimore Symphony at Carnegie Hall and uh, uh, very supportive. I, I think that, um, you know, for me, I remember so many of the firsts I've lived through them and watching women struggle to become the first at doing so many things. Um, and watching the feminist movement sort of be shut down gradually. I, I, think it's, I think the pendulum is now swinging back though and I'm encouraged by the fact that young women today, they, they don't even consider not doing something. So, you know, I think subtly somehow it's all coming to, uh, to fruition and pretty soon equality will reign. I have to believe it. What's the most meaningful advice you've ever received? I think the most meaningful advice has been uh, to keep a lot of irons in the fire. Don't put, you know, it's kind of like all those parables, don't put, put all your eggs in one basket. Always have a plan B. What one piece of advice would you give to a young woman on building a career? My best advice, I think, is to find that which you're passionate about and, and never give up. What about work-life balance, having children and maintaining a career? Yeah, that's hard work. I, I'm not sure. Uh, listen, having children is hard work regardless of what else you're doing. So uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I think you have to try to find a balance. And I think remember that for kids, just being present is 50% of the game. So when you're with them, be very present. What accomplishment are you most proud of? Oh, probably my seven-year-old son. What was your very first paying job? Um, I played, this wouldn't constitute a playing job, but I played on the corner of Fifth Avenue near St. Patrick's Cathedral and I made 30 bucks. And that was a lot of money in those days. What three adjectives best describe you? Determined, um, hardworking, and I'd say funny. What person that you've never met has had the biggest influence on your life? I don't think there's anyone I haven't met that has seriously influenced my life. There are many people I admire from Charlie Chaplin to Abraham Lincoln. But I think I've been fortunate to meet all the people who've influenced me. And how has getting this appointment and breaking the so-called barrier affected you? It's been fantastic. I think, I think it really, um, it's given me a huge canvas in America and uh, a huge platform to really 
I think, changed the face of the 21st century orchestra. So I got a ways to go still. What was the first piece of music that really... That you Brahms. Could... And tell me why. Or... Okay. The first piece of music that uh, really made me understand that music would be my life was a chamber piece by Johannes Brahms, a string sextet in B-flat. And I heard it when I was 12 years old, and I was walking past someone's room, they were playing a record. I realized that uh, music has the power to change lives, and it's transformative, and I'll never forget that moment, and if I can bring that moment to someone else, my, my life will be worth it.